Welcome to Programming. In this class, we are going to use processing as our programming language. So processing is a modified version of Java. So all the code that you're going to be typing is actually in Java, but it's utilizing a library that someone, a couple people actually, well, even now community because it's open source, have contributed to making the programming process a little bit easier. So this library allows us to dispense with some of the annoyances of programming and get started making cool things right away. So the first step is to go to processing.org and to download processing. So to do that, you go to processing right on the home page. You'll see where it says download, click on download, and then choose the appropriate version based on your hardware. So if you are running Windows, Mac, Linux, if you're on Mac, you do have to pay attention to, do you have one of the newer Macs with the M1 chips, the Apple Silicon versus the older Intel chips. So you do have to choose the correct version of processing for your setup. And once you download that and install it, and it's a pretty quick and extremely painless download, or install process, then we can go and launch processing. Now when we launch it, it always starts out with creating a basic sketch. So the sketch that it creates, it will be named according to the date on it. And then this is where we can start typing our code. Now we may notice a couple things as I start typing here. One is that the code is really small. Now, we'll see a few other things that we'll talk about, such as we it's telling me I have some syntax errors. So it does try and help us when we're coding to error check. It's not infallible. It's not always super helpful, but it's better than nothing, which is how it used to be uh, ages ago. So to make my code a little bit easier to read in the videos, I am going to go into my preferences for processing. And on uh, the Mac, it's under processing. Under Windows, it will be under edit. And I can see my editor font size. So if I bump that up to say 18, and I can type in a number if I wanted 16 or 12 or 13 or whatever makes me happy, I can do that. And now we can see that makes it a little bit easier to read on screen. Now this window that I'm typing in is a little bit small, so I'm going to make that a little bit bigger. Whoop. Um, had my hand on the trackpad and the mouse at the same time. That doesn't work very well, so let's try again. All right, so now as I go to type, there's a few things that we have to keep in mind. If I type the word size, if I type the word size, and if I type the word size, and if I type... So all of these are size, but we have different capitalizations that go along with them. Now, processing like Java is, and most programming languages are case sensitive. So we do have to make sure that we are using the appropriate capitalization. Now that may you know, bring up the question of, well, how do I know what is the correct capitalization? The short answer is you will learn over time. And most of the time, everything is going to be lowercase, but there are some items that are uppercase. And when they're uppercase, that's because they're referencing a item called a class. Now, that is something we'll talk about in a subsequent session. But right now, most things are all just going to be lowercase, so that should make your life a little bit easier. Now, if you're going, but how am I going to remember this? How am I going to keep track of all these details? How am I going to know things? How do I even know where to begin or where to start? Well, one, you watch the videos. If there's readings, you go along with readings. But we'll also see in processing that we have something here where we have reference. Now we, if we highlight something, we can choose find and reference and it'll find it directly, but I'm just going to choose reference. And when I do that, 
it goes on to the processing website and it pulls up the reference. Now we can see it's broken into different categories and there are lots of different things to look through here. So we're not going to cover all of these, but we will, over the course of this class, go through quite a few of these, but also give you insight in how you might be able to then use more than what we're covering, because a lot of them are very similar. So say keyboard, once you understand one or two of these, you can do all of them. Once you understand one or two of the mouse items, you can do all of them. So we're going to learn how to utilize these help documents as ways to expand upon what we are covering. Now, if I go to environment, we can see we have a number of things that are here. Oh, here's environment. This is what I was actually, that was structure. I don't know why oh, it didn't link correctly, but we'll see here is size and we can see it as lowercase. Now, some things you'll notice, see how there are capital letters. This is called camel casing. When we put two words together, we capitalize the first letter of the second word. That's a common way of joining words together in most programming languages. So if I click on size, it brings me here and it gives me information about what is happening within it. We can then see examples of how to use it and more of the detailed specifics and also related items. So learning how to use the help document is going to be really useful when we are working on our projects. So we can see that currently it tells me, you know, there's an error here on line one. And if I go back into size, we'll see that size has a couple parentheses and it has some numbers in it. Now if it, we go and look at what that is, we can see size, width, height. Okay. So that's the basic command. We'll also notice that there's a semicolon at the end. And that is something that when we are writing our code. So now if I put in something like say 800 comma 600 and put a semicolon, the red went away, the red error message went away. So a couple things here. Semicolons are how we terminate each command, which is typically each line, but we'll see some, there are some things, you know, that we don't do that when we add in some extra returns, which we'll be getting to shortly. But we have a semicolon to punctuate the end of a line. Now, I did not put a space after the comma here. I can, but I don't have to. It's entirely up to you on how you use white space. So while programming languages are very specific about capitalization, they often don't really care about white space. So you can put in a bunch of spaces if it makes your code more readable. And, you know, heck, yeah, we can put spaces. We can indent at the beginning of a line which we'll use indents to help make our code more readable as we build more complex programs. So if I just type in size 800 by 600, now we have these obvious buttons up here, run, stop. So if I hit run, let's see what happens. And it popped up on my other screen, so I'll just move it over here. And here is my sketch. Now I'm going to just leave these two just shrink this so I can see both of them at the same time. If I change this to 200 and hit run again, we'll see that now it changed the size. Now I can hit stop, that goes away. I can hit run, it comes back. So this is the core way that we can work with this. What we are going is that we have our commands, we run to see what our program looks like, we stop to stop it. Now, once you are working on your program, you, you might want to save because, well, as if you've worked on computers long enough, you know that they sometimes crash. So we want to save as we go. We don't want to spend hours writing code and then 
attempt to save for the first time and have it crash or the power flicker or something happen immediately before, you know, that, that would really suck. So when we go to save our project, it's defaulting to our processing folder. So we could save it in that location. But uh, for right now, I'm just going to put mine on the desktop and I prefer to rename this. And the convention that we're going to use through this course is to use your initials and then underscore and then the name of what the project is. And we put our initials in the naming of it so that it's easier to keep track of, you know, which project belongs to who because otherwise when I look at projects, it says first project or game or catcher or whatever it is and they're all named the same so it's harder to figure out what is going on and I because I am so accustomed to using camel casing anytime I'm typing things on my computer and joining words together and names of documents I use camel casing as part of it now notice how it says save sketch folder as this is going to be important now I hit save. You can see it changed the name up here. It doesn't say sketch and the date. And if I move this over, we'll see that it created a folder. If I open up that folder, we will see that there is now a file in it. Name of folder, the primary file that belongs to that folder has the same name, but it has a .pde extension. So it's a processing document. PDE. So it's important that when we are working with projects that we also name them so that we're following it with, you know, the initials. And anytime that you are trying to share a project, say submit it for evaluation or submit it for assistance and help, that you don't just send the processing document but you need to send the whole folder because if I want to open the document, it needs to be in a containing folder. So the easiest way to do that is on the Mac, right click on it and choose compress. And then when I do that, it creates a zip of it and that zip is what you can then email, you can upload, share it however you want, airdrop, etc. If you're on Windows, you go under right click on it and choose send to and then on the drop down list there choose compressed archive that also will create the zip file that we are looking for so that is the way that i would ask for you to submit anything for evaluation or help all right so going back into our project here i've put size on it now one thing that's really nice about processing is it's a language that was developed to allow designers, artists, and other creative types to code. Because a lot of programming languages have a lot of overhead and baggage that goes with them, making it difficult to get into coding. And processing was developed for creative coding. And to that end, it often is about visual output. So that's why when we run it, we see this show up and I'm just going to go change this back to 600 so it's a little better size wise. With our sketch in place it's time to add something so that we can see it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a rectangle. Well I'm going to make it a square but so we type in the word rect and we have to declare where we want it to appear and how big we want it to be. So if I put this at 100, remembering we're going you know, from the left edge over. So I'll go 100, comma, and then I'm going to go down 200, comma. Now notice here I'm putting in spaces after the commas. Do you, don't you? Entirely up to you. And I'm going to make this 100 
by 100 pixels in size. Now if I run this, let's see, it went over 100, down 200, and it drew a rectangle. Now I can draw a circle here. Now if I draw this at 100, 200, 100, now a circle, it's just with a diameter. Oh, and I need my semicolon. I must have run without the semicolon. Now if I put it there, we can see that the circle draws from its middle here, where the rectangle is drawing from its corner. So we can see how it's drawing at that point. So technically, if I wanted this to be in alignment, I need to move it over half of its width or its radius and now I can put a circle inside a square. So what this should be cluing you in is that you need to start thinking about positions and how to lay things out on the screen. Now if you're like, well how do I know, you know, this is going by the center, this is going by the corner, and what's going on with that? Well, what we can do, if we go back in our reference here and look for items. Now if you're like, well, where is it in here? I can just search this page. If I just type in rec, all right, I found 13 of them. That's not the one I want. Let's see, there's rec mode. No, I don't want that. Let's continue. And now we're under 2D primitives. Now those are in the shape section. So if I'd gone through that. So using the search can be a great way to do it. Now here is rec. If I click on that, we can see, we get information of telling us what it is. We can even round corners on it. So as we can see, we have a few options. The easiest, which is the one I did, A, B, C, D, which is where is it X, Y, width, and height. So I didn't put in a radius for the corners or any of that. Let's see. Now, if I just scroll down over here, can I find it? Image, pixels, shape, there we go, primitives. Now let's bop over to circle. And we also have ellipse. Now ellipse would be where we have a height and a width to a round object, which is different than a circle, which is always going to be round. So if I go to circle, we can see we have our three parameters, x, y, and the diameter of that circle. And by default, it draws it from its center. Now if we go back to our 2D primitives, this time let's go look at ellipse and we can see it has x, y with height. So again, it's pretty similar. Now I often will use ellipse and now let's just try 100, 100, or 200. So that creates something similar to a circle, and we can see now it put it over there. So once again, if we put it over 50 and over 50, and I'm just going to make this one smaller so we can see that it's existing. Something else you may notice. We drew a rectangle, then I drew a circle, then I drew a circle. Well, well, so we can see we're drawing these objects. But if I move the rectangle to here, watch what happens. We can see that it now all three objects are being drawn. But we can't see them readily unless I move that over. So one thing that happens when we are coding is the code executes in the order that it is called. Now there are ways that we can make a reference or call code that happens later in our document, but without that 
typically it will just go line by line and execute whatever is on that line. So it created the size of our document on screen. It drew a circle, it drew the smaller ellipse, and then it drew the rectangle on top of it. So it's doing this in the order that these lines of code appear. So if the ellipse is drawn before the circle, we'll never be able to see it as long as these circles or ellipses and rectangles are all filled with solid color. And in this case, the color is white. Now you are probably thinking, gee, gray background, black lines, white fills. It's kind of boring. So maybe we want to add some color in and go, hmm, how do I do that? How do we fill it in? Now, something I will regularly ask you to do is to just think about what you're trying to do and write it out, not in code, just in English, just plain language. Specify the instructions, the items that you're trying to accomplish. And as you do that, you start to discover some of the clues as to what you might need to be able to then execute it. So I go back into my reference and just do a search. I typed in fill because I want to fill with my color. Sets the color used to fill shapes. Sets the color for the background of the processing window background. Oh, sweet. Okay, well, why don't we do that one first? We'll get some color in there. Now, when we designate the color, notice we use one value, and that is setting our red, green, and blue color values to the same number. Thus, it will create shades of gray going from white to black. So, 000, zero, zero is black, 255, 255, 255, or 0 or 255 would be, you know, 0 is black, 255 is white. So it's using RGB color values. If you've worked in Photoshop or Illustrator or any other graphics program where you've used RGB color sliders, you're used to having those numbers associated with it. Now, if I look here, we can see RGB. RGB alpha, gray, gray alpha. And then we also have um, red, green, and blue. So we can put those in. So we have a lot of different ways that we can fill with our different color values, which makes it quite fun as we want to put in our numbers. So the easiest is we just use four numbers, red, green, blue, and a alpha value as part of it. So if I go background, background's one word, not two, so don't try and camel case it. And if I said background 128, which is halfway between 0 and 255, and run my sketch, we'll see that it comes up with a gray value. Now, if I put in 255, 0, 0, that means red is maxed out, green and blue are not, we will end up with a very bright red background. Now, if you're good at mixing colors, fantastic. If you're not, go under Color Selector, and we'll see that we have the ability to, okay, if I want to create kind of a, actually, I want to go, you know, that color right there, we can see 127, 103, and 227. Now, if I copy this and put in my color here, we'll see that we now have a hex color, and we can put that in as well. Now, if we're doing that, we don't get the option to add in our transparency, but if I wanted, oh, and backgrounds can't be transparent anyway, but if we're going to fill something, so now if I go and say, hey, I want to use that color right there, now what I can do is say fill, Go 227, comma, 103, comma, 206. Let's run our sketch. And we'll see that all the objects are filled that way. But if I were to, say, put in 
50% transparency. Remembering 0 to 255, 0 would be 100% transparent. 255 would be 100% opaque. So if I do 255, it will look like the color is solid. Okay. If I go 0, it's transparent. If I go 100, so we can start experimenting and seeing how this works. So you can see when all three are stacked on top of each other, it's starting to get pretty close to that opaque color, though there's a little bit of the background still showing through. Notice also how the color now is applied to these. So a fill color, once you set it, it's going to stay that way until you put in an additional fill color. So now if I put in another fill color here and go 103, 217, 227, 150. Uh, let's see what that looks like. Okay. Now that applied for two objects. And now for a rectangle, if I go fill, Right here. This one I'm just going to do solid. Oops. The wrong parenthesis. Uh, one other thing, anytime you open a parenthesis, notice how it highlighted its pair. If I just click by it, click after it here, we can see it's like, oh, that parenthesis thinks that is its mate. So parentheses, curly braces, square braces, they always need a partner, a mate. They cannot exist solo. So as you write your code, it's important to put those in. So now you can see how I'm able to change colors. I've put in multiple objects. I've changed my background color. I've changed the size of my project. So I've done all the basic things that I need for creating a simple project here. Now, something that would be useful while you are working is you add in comments. Now, comments are lines that you put in your code that make your code a little bit easier to read. So I'll go back up to the top here. And the first thing that I want to do to put in a comment, and we designate something to be a comment by using two slashes here. And now I can put in today's date. So I can go 0, 8, 2, 1, oh, 2, 2. Now, I can also put in my name, which would be useful. Now, there's a keyboard shortcut for turning something to a comment and uncommenting, which we use quite often when we are trying to debug or figure out why our code is broken. So we highlight lines of code and we very quickly, so if I highlight some lines of code, I hold down my command or control key, command on Mac, control on Windows, and then I hit the slash key on the right side of the keyboard right under the question mark, and that comments it. Now if my cursor is in the line of code, I click on it, it will uncomment that line of code. So I don't have to highlight the whole thing to make it happen. I can just click in it, command slash, command slash. So date, name, title of what this is. I can put in a return empty white space. So now I'm, notice how I'm organizing things. I have the size of my sketch, the background. These are for the main part of it. You can put in additional comments, which has something in a program that gets bigger you may want. So as I try to define what things are, and we may put in white space. So this, with the comments, with the additional lines of white space, makes my program much easier to understand and easier to read. What I'm going to do now is change this around a little bit because I just want to make a simple smiley face. So beginning with that 
I want to create a circle that is going to be a little bit bigger and I'm going to make it opaque so I just run it I want to see what it looks like with that color okay that works now this time I want my circle to start oh yeah we can start it at uh, we're going to start at a hundred and one hundred let's make it four hundred let's see what we get here all right so I made it four hundred my whole thing is six hundred so now we need to adjust and move this over so remembering that circles draw from the middle so if I actually go 400 and 300, knowing that that's half and half, we can now see how I drew a circle on the center of my screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little kind of a face. It may not be a smiley face, maybe a less than smiley face. We'll see as we work with it. So now I have my main body, the head, that I have drawn. Oh, I deleted the wrong. I wanted to delete the transparency and the color, not the um, shape, so I deleted from the wrong line. So now this circle that I have drawn here, let's move this one over. So remembering that when we draw an ellipse, Let's check ellipse versus circle. If I go at 0, 0, 50, where's the draw? So we can see its center is the point we're targeting. So if we know this is as an X that is 400, and our circle is 400 wide, so that's 200. So now if we go back, say, 300 for this ellipse here, and I'm going to go down, let's just put in 200 and use that as a starting point because I'm trying to create an eye. All right, I want to go further down. Let's go down. I want to go 300 because that's the middle. So let's actually try 250. And what I want to do is to put in an additional ellipse. So I'll just go Put my fingers on the right keys when I start. So we went over back 100 so this time knowing that the middle is at 400 I'm going to go over an additional 100 so I'll say 500 then 250 comma 50 comma 50 and now let's run this and see what we get. Hey look we got two circles. All right now if I want to adjust my mouth here let's move this down so we know the middle is at um, 400. So we need to go back over. I mean, if I wanted it to be centered over the eyes, I could go 300 here for my X. I know the Y has to be more than 400, so we'll go, or 300, so let's go 400. And width wise, I want to go 200 wide. And I'll shrink the height up to, let's just throw an 80. Let's see what we get here. And that's a little low, and it's a little more open than I want. So I'm going to go 60, and we'll change this to 350. So what I hope you're realizing here is that we can be flexible while we do this. We can play a little bit. We don't have to resign ourselves to you know, being like I have to know everything before I hit go or run. It's processing is designed to be very iterative, that we do something, we hit run, and let's see how it works. What does it look like? Is it functioning? Is it doing what we want it to do? And when we do it that way, I would argue coding becomes less scary because you're not worried about breaking it. If you make an error in your code, it's not going to make your computer explode. It's not going to crash. It's not going to, you know, do anything. You know, if I just 
Go right here, we can see that, hey, look, I didn't put a semicolon, and now it's failing on this line. And the syntax says, missing semicolon. I'm like, okay, well, wait, there's one here. So where's, oh, look, I deleted it from there, and now it's fixed. Now, if we do something like this, we'll see that ellipse, it says, requires float, 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 float. It requires four numbers, but I only have three numbers here. So that's a good indication of... Oh, that's what's broken. So when you're typing these things in, that's what we can use as a way to figure it out. Now, uh, let's see if I, that's what I wanted. I want to go back to my 2D primitives because then we could see, we could even make something like a triangle. Um, arcs, oh, and we could do a line or a point. Quads and arcs get a little wonky. Triangle's not too bad, but what you'll notice is it has six numbers because we have to define the X and Y of each vertex or corner or point on the triangle. So X1, Y1, X2, Y2, X3, Y3. So each one is a point on that triangle. So if we go back here, I'm going to put in a nose here. Well, actually, uh, let's put a, some comments in and go head eyes so the more you put in comments when you're writing your code the easier it is when you go back and look at it later or when you're trying to troubleshoot it's going to just make everybody's life a lot easier so now for the nose so as I'm looking at the nose okay I want to fill the nose. I'm going to use some variation of, we'll go for a brighter pink color here. So I'll just choose fill and heck, we'll just copy that because I want it opaque. And you'll notice also there's no problem going between um, RGB number values and hex uh, color designations. There's no issue whatsoever going between those. So you can mix and match as uh, you feel is appropriate in your program. So now triangle. So if I want to center the nose here, we know that the center is 400, 300. So to that, I'm going to go up a little bit. I'm going to start by drawing the top point and then I'll work my way clockwise around on the nose. So the top point I want to, from the middle, I'm going to go up 50. So that means 350, oh wait, X. So X will still be 400 because I'm going straight up from the middle, but then the Y, instead of being at 300, knowing that 300 is our middle, we need to go up to 250. Now we're going to go down past the middle a little bit. So if I want to go down past the middle um, and over, so I'm going to say 425 over, because it's x2, and then the middle is at 300, so I'm going to go 3, we'll just start out with 320, so that works. And now our next, our x3, if we went over 25, now I need to go back 25 because we had the 425, so from 400 we went over 425, so we went over. Now the middle is 400, so we go back another 25, 375, but our Y will stay the same at 320. And let's see how that works, see if it lines up. And now I have a nose. So I've been able to create a simple face. And as you begin your adventure into coding, this is a useful way to start to learn and understand how to create a basic creature, a basic shape. You get to work visually, you get to work with different commands in your code to arrive at a destination. Good luck and have fun.